Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we talk about the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna. And me, Frederick. This week, we are sitting with Chris Goes from Tendermint. Chris is the IBC lead and works on the Cosmos Network, or in the Cosmos Network? How should I say that? I would say I'm a participant in the Cosmos Network, and I also work on the Cosmos Network. Okay. Those sets are intersecting, <laughs> not completely intersecting. All right. Well, welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you. And we have Frederick. Hello. So I've never fully understood what you do. I've met, I, we've hung out a fair bit. I see you at full note every once in a while, but what what is your focus? Like, what is your work at Tendermint? At Tendermint, I focus on IBC, which stands for Interblockchain Communication. IBC, I would describe as a set of abstractions that we're working on for message passing, ordering, and authentication between heterogeneous chains. So between blockchains with different consensus algorithms, different state machines, some common high-level properties that we can encapsulate into IBC, um, and then use those properties and those like abstractions like like clients to allow them to talk to each other in a uniform fashion. Is IBC as it is today the same thing that was first proposed? Like when was is, is it sort of built in the way that like IBC was specked out? Like researchers decided this is what it's going to be and then you've been building it? Or is this something that's evolved? Is this the same thing that was described like, I don't know, when it first came out? I would say that IBC is has evolved uh, over time, but it is still a ideological descendant of the key idea, which was to allow uh, blockchains to use like clients uh, to validate each other's state and thereby construct a uh, arbitrary message packing, passing mechanism between heterogeneous chains. I think actually as background, so we had Sunny on the show last May, and I think it might be useful for people to listen to that episode because that really describes like the Cosmos Network and he mentions sort of where IBC lives, but I don't think we went into it at all. Um, what, do you, what do you think people think IBC is and what is IBC? I would say there are two common misconceptions. The first is easy to dispel. The second, I'll do my best. The first misconception is that IBC is a protocol for token transfers. Uh, we suspect that this arose out of our inclusion of token transfers as the example of choice in the Cosmos white paper. Uh, of course, the Cosmos white paper is now this you know, exalted document that we can no longer modify, uh, so we cannot revise the example. But um, in fact, IBC, the core protocol, doesn't even reason about tokens at all. It just reasons about messages. Those messages can contain anything that the application might care about. You Could can build token transfers on top of IBC. You can build cross-chain voting, cross-chain delegation, cross-chain staking. You can build uh, certain kinds of code transfer, which then start to look like sharding if you're passing contracts around. IBC is constructed as a layered protocol. So uh, in a pretty close direct analogy to TCP IP, IBC is designed to sit on top of blockchains, where blockchains are analogized to network cards, provide the uh, transport authentication and ordering layers, and then be used by applications on top. So protocols on top of IBC uh, are analogous to HTTP in the TCP IP context. HTTP uses the packet sending and receiving functionalities of TCP IP to provide websites. And you can implement uh, token transfer. We have a spec uh, numbered ICS20 uh, as an application layer protocol similarly, similarly on top of IBC. Uh, was IBC designed for Cosmos specifically? Like in, in in the way that it was created and designed, was it like with Cosmos in mind? Or did you take it from a perspective of let's try to design the most generic and like featureful protocol, whether or not Cosmos can actually use that? Uh, yes to both questions. Uh, insofar as it had Cosmos in mind, it had the idea of Cosmos as uh, a composition of heterogeneous protocols, which means that there are things we can't assume, uh, which in some ways makes it more complex. It might be possible to design something simpler that only works for a subset of consensus algorithms or a subset of use cases, and those protocols are valuable, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to design something that works for most blockchains out there uh, in the world today and that we hope will emerge in the future. So you mentioned the first point, the yes. first misconception. 
What's the second? The second misconception, um, touching on a bit what I just mentioned, is that IBC solves a particular problem, uh, not necessarily token transfers, but that it's, say, that it's uh, an interoperability protocol for Cosmos, where com Cosmos is some closed set of blockchains following some prescribed um, list of rules. Uh, that's not our goal. Our goal is to define a protocol which can be uh, adopted not only by chains which exist today, but integrated uh, into chains which will exist in the future, just like when uh, architects of TCPIP sat down to write a network protocol, I wasn't there, but I assume they wanted that network protocol to uh, be supported by network cards, by hardware that didn't exist yet. Had they built assumptions about particular existent chipsets into their protocol, then no one could have ever built new hardware because people would have ended up depending on the particular properties of those chipsets. So similarly, we want to limit the assumptions which people using IBC can rely upon in order to allow it to support many blockchains and protocols that have, don't yet exist. Would you say though, like, wh what does IBC stand for? Inter-blockchain communication. Is the core idea of IBC just like bridges? Is bridging a very key part of this protocol or is that separate? Different people use the word bridge to mean different things. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's used to mean uh, a token bridge, which I would consider an application layer protocol on top of IBC. Sometimes it's used to be, mean a more generic message passing bridge, and that is similar to IBC. Usually, though, bridge refers to a specific pair of chains and, and then uh, like a specific instantiation of some uh, validation algorithm. And in that sense, it's different. IBC will consist of you know many bridges, not a single bridge. Yeah, I so I, that's my misconception is I just thought IBC was like the bridges <laughs> for some reason. That's like how I understood it. And I actually I had this sort of follow up question to that, which is like we did this episode on bridges and there was these different ways that bridges can interact, either mint and burn or lock and lock. I think those were, was that the two lock and unlock kind of thing? Right. Th is, that sounds like a token transfer bridge. All right. And this is not. Like this is – there's nothing in the IBC protocol that talks about this specifically or there's no model that it has to follow. So there are different layers of the IBC protocol. The core layer does not talk about tokens. It just talks about blockchains and modules and simple capabilities, the minimum ontology that we think is necessary to abstract over the use cases we care about. On top of the core protocol sits the application layer protocol. And just like it's helpful to standardize on TCP IP, it will also be helpful to standardize on um, like the application layer protocols for things like token transfer. And we've written a token transfer protocol which describes uh, something like mint, burn, lock, unlock, uh, and that can be standardized on on top of IBC. Got it. I mean, uh, IBC, is, at least as I understand it, isn't software. <laughs> you know, it isn't a, a bridge is software. It's, you know, a module on this chain, it's a module on that chain or a smart contract or something. It's a set of relayer nodes. It's a game theoretic, you know, system of, of ensuring that certain things happen. It's all, it's just software. It's like engineering, whereas IBC is a conceptual thing. It's how you pass those messages between these different software components. That's right. And in particular, IBC also tries to articulate uh, what properties are required of these lower level abstractions like light like clients, what the blockchains have to provide, the minimal set of things that they have to provide because we want to make it as easy as possible to adopt, and then compose those properties into some gestalt security properties of the whole system. So when you use IBC, if your blockchain correctly instantiates these abstractions, what do you get? You get exactly once message delivery, you get certain guarantees about ordering, you get guarantees about either the message is authenticated or someone will get slashed, this sort of thing. To follow up on what you just said, Frederick, what is it then? Like you just said, <laughs> it's not a piece of software. Like, is it libraries? Is it Rules? It's a specification, and the specification yeah. we hope will be implemented by uh, many different pieces of individual pieces of software. The most uh, complete implementation so far is the one in Go being developed by the Cosmos SDK team at Tendermint. There are also in progress implementations in uh, Rust, in JavaScript, um, potentially in other languages coming soon. An interesting question for me in like how far the 
protocol goes is sort of would you recommend that, for instance, ETH2 use IBC for cross-chain communication? Because that's now we're not talking about bridges anymore. It's not a bridged system at all. It's all integrated. It's using one shared consensus algorithm. But it's still, you know, to some degree, conceptually, different blockchains talking to each other. Right. Uh, I've actually been looking into this a little bit recently, and I'm not yet done evaluating whether our abstraction stack can be cleanly mapped onto what ETH2 wants to do. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what they want to do, so I'll need to ask them more to figure that out. But I think the answer in principle ought to be yes. Uh, what people want to do when they're sending messages across shards or across chains generally requires the same kinds of guarantees. Uh, but we need to ensure that we've picked the right abstraction such that no performance penalty will be paid and such that we can correctly capture the varying security models. Because IBC is written with the uh, minimal assumption set. So the protocol itself doesn't assume any kind of shared security, doesn't assume any kind of... Uh, consensus synchronization between these chains that assumes that they're sovereign or operating independently. When you are running in a system where that's not true, such as ETH2 or such as Polkadot, you can make more assumptions and those assumptions should allow you to simplify things, to avoid certain proofs, to uh, maybe do things that would be unsafe in the more general model. And we want IBC to encapsulate that as well. It will probably take a little more work and some specific instantiation for ETH2 or for Polkadot or something like that. No. I suppose it's hard. And like, as you said, it's been designed with the Cosmos ecosystem in mind. Once you're exposed to a fresh new world, it's sort of like, what actually applies here? What doesn't? Is this a leaky abstraction now or isn't it? And how you iterate on that to, to move outside of your originally envisaged uh, boundaries is interesting. I, mm -hmm. I mean, to your point of uh, TCP IP, People praise this a lot, like the, the protocol, and it is successful. But I remember reading this blog post from a network engineer once, and he talks about all the leaky abstractions that exist from, from like how things are transferred on the wire to like how they have to implement things in hardware and the amount of hacks that is needed <laughs> to go from like you loading something in your browser to something being sent over the wire is amazing. It's, it's wow. an insane amount of hacks needed to get there. So they've been successful and they've been successful in, in, in adopting like technology that came 30 years after they invented it. But at the same time, you know, it, it's not super clean. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I would say that the important part and the part upon which I hope we will be able to standardize is a uh, common ontology and terminological set for exposing these cross-chain primitives to developers on these systems, on Cosmos, on Polkadot, on ETH2, writing contracts who need to reason about the security and the safety of what they're doing. Uh, without understanding all of the nitty-gritty implementation details. And if we can agree on things like channels for sending messages, if we can agree on delivery properties, if we can agree on what you know finality means um, in that context, this will be very helpful to developers who probably interface with multiple systems. Does it almost have like a standards element to it? What you just described just sounds like standardization of terminology. We hope that it will. We hope that it will. We have a ecosystem working group currently composed of um, Tendermint, the Interchain Foundation, and Agoric, and more people are invited. Polkadot is more than welcome. Um, as is anyone else listening to this podcast, shoot me an email. <laughs> yeah, more seriously, the goal is to standardize. Okay. Uh, and we, are, we want to uh, create a vehicle for long-term stewardship of the protocol, you know, independent. Uh, I mean, the Cosmos ecosystem is a, is a vague term. It can mean the Cosmos hub. It can mean the blockchains connect to the Cosmos hub. It can mean anyone who uses the Cosmos software. Um, and it's up to you to define what you mean by it. But uh, IBC certainly should exist as an independent entity. You don't need to connect to the Cosmos hub to use it. We want the standardization process to reflect that. Would you, like, does IBC compare to the beacon chain or the relay chain in the Polkadot world? For some reason, I've, I've sometimes heard it, like, categorized as doing the same thing. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Polkadot uses, uh, has a messaging protocol for communication between parachains that 
basically uses the relay chain to perform all of the verification and ordering. So the relay chain is responsible for uh, checking that headers are inserted in the right order and the ingress queues and uh, egress queues. A confusing way to anyway um, <laughs> are are like co uh, coherently ordered so that the properties that the whole system seeks to provide are fulfilled. Uh, in IBC, that's similar to what we call a proxy client architecture, where uh, the parachains are relying on the relay chain's verification to determine whether or not they intend to accept and process messages. And how does it how would it compare to the beacon chain then? Or has the beacon chain changed so much? I have not that yet it's... seen a specific enough standard for how the beacon chain will handle message passing in ETH2 to, to comment on that. All right. Yeah, I, I, as far as I know, I mean, I'm not up to date on like the last three months of work, maybe, but I have not seen a, a legit proposal for cross chain communication in ETH2. Um, I don't think it's something that they've actually spec'd out yet. Yeah. I think a lot of the hard problems are topological, as in they will be shared between Cosmos, Polkadot, and ETH2, and they mainly have to do with state dependencies in cases where you want some sort of atomic commit or rollback. There is probably a lot of distributed systems researcher research that could be uh, looked at more seriously before we try to invent new solutions, but a lot of the costs are different. So things like mutual exclusion locks are just going to be exorbitantly expensive when locks require sending transactions to all of these shards and those transactions consume gas, this sort of thing. So. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head there with um, there is a lot of preceding work in this area. I think it is kind of uh, odd to think about that we're inventing something new because I mean, even the terms that you just said, like queues and ingress and egress and all of these things are things that are defined. There is, you know, a whole set of work around queuing theory, you know, the distributed systems work has been going on for 20, 30 years and they've, they've solved a lot of these problems. So really what we're, what we should be trying to do is just trying to bring in the context of a blockchain. Like, what does finality mean when you're applying it in in this you know scenario? Um, we already know how queues behave. We already know how to do message ordering, or I mean, no, as in you know there is research on this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to look at. You know, what are we bringing to the table? What does a blockchain bring to the table of distributed systems research? What assumptions do we have to change? What do we have to build in to our model that, you know, we can't just take everything right out of existing research, but at the same time, we shouldn't ignore all existing research. And we haven't even gotten to the game theory. I mean, we're still at the level in these sharded systems of how do we actually route the messages to the right places at the right times? We're not yet at the level and we need to get to it if it's going to be resilient on an open internet. Uh, we need to get to the level of here are the actors, here are their uh, you know, incentives or utility functions, at least some kind of modeling of how people will behave and are these security models we're constructing, especially with proof of stake, are they uh, coherent in that environment? It's interesting, you like just to kind of go back to that when we were talking about the way that like the ETH2 shards would interact in this case, like would could I be could it be something like there's a beacon chain with the shards underneath it and then IBC like the beacon chain is under IBC? Like because shards to me are not unique blockchains. So yeah, like I, I'm trying to picture like how they would potentially interact. Uh but they have independent execution. And that is that's enough for IBC. Okay. So you could even run, although it would be unnecessary, but if you had a non-sharded blockchain, you could run IBC and it would just sort of look like a loopback client, just like you can run a web browser on your computer and view a locally rendered website created in a different process. So where is IBC at today? Where is IBC at today? Uh, on the internet, it is at uh, github slash cosmos slash ICS. Uh, in terms of standardization uh, progress, I think it's at release candidate five of 1.0. Um, what would that mean? There will on a progress bar, where, where is that? <laughs> uh, 
Ninety percent,、uh, oh, okay. I would say it's very close,、okay. and we've been surprisingly pleased to find that in the process of implementing the spec, we first wrote a spec and then wrote an implementation. We've needed to change little, most of it.、Uh, we, you know, modulo testing in production, but most of it we think、uh, we got more or less the way we intended to.、Hmm. So for this episode, one of the things that you know we definitely want to focus on. Is this idea of incorporating zero knowledge on many levels into an interoperability setup? And I think it's really cool that you just gave some background on IBC. There's a lot of that stuff I actually wasn't as familiar with as I thought I was. <laughs> so I think it's good to get that update. But yeah, I want to shift over now towards zero knowledge. The first thing I want to ask you is what. Like, how did you actually become interested in it in the first place? How did I become interested? Because I think、the、I met、internet. you. <laughs> I mean, to, to a fair warning, I am no zero knowledge、uh, cryptographer、uh, by formal training or by expertise, just still taunt. But、um, yeah, I became involved in and in blockchains first, and found out about zero knowledge through、uh, blockchains. I couldn't pinpoint the precise time or date. But might but, have been Zcash. Okay. The thing is, I know you more through like I think the ZK Summit and stuff like that. You, you had been participating in a lot of these groups. So what? Where is that connection then? Like, how does the zero knowledge research stuff relate to what you just explained with with the IBC work? It relates in、uh, a lot of different ways.、Uh, zero knowledge proofs are really, or I think they will eventually become a primitive. That people build into software in a lot of different ways, just like、uh, existing cryptography, like just like、uh, signature schemes are used for many different purposes in blockchains. You don't really, you don't, you don't. At this point, you don't start from the question of, oh, I have a signature scheme. What can I build with it? It's like, <laughs> what do I need? And the signature scheme is one of the possible tools to address、uh, many different kinds of needs. And I think the same will be true with CKPs eventually. In the context of interoperability, I would say there are. Uh, two categories and one has two subcategories. So zero knowledge proofs can be used for、uh, broadly scaling or、uh, no no privacy, no alterations to the state machine, but just allowing different chains or different modules within those chains to talk to each other more efficiently or with better security guarantees. And they can be used for、um, providing privacy in some aspect of the state machine. That could be. In、uh, sending tokens, so like Zcash, it could be in governance. It could even be proof of stake. Whether we want private proof of stake or not, different question, but it's possible.、Um, and then within that second category,、uh, I would say it's worth differentiating between applications where all of the state of the zero knowledge system will live on a single chain, so like the current Sapling circuit on Zcash will live on one chain, or where、uh, in the second、uh, option where that state is. Charted or split between multiple chains, where you have some kind of、um, gestalt circuit, but its actual、uh, state—you know, parts of different commitment trees for sets of notes—is、uh, stored on many different blockchains or even different shards of a single system. And in this case, the privacy feature would be actually like cross blockchain. Is that because you put that in the privacy category? That, that that's right.、Uh, I mean, I think to users, what would end up being exposed.、Uh, Is hopefully a unified state,、uh, but the actual state would be split between chains, and that could be used to. There are lots of implementation questions, which I hope we'll get to.、Uh, and an example that I've always talked about with Polkadot, and and like when, you know, way back when the the paper was first released, I I'm not sure if the paper talked about this case or not, but it, it's something that we kind of. Explicitly tried to design around, and that is allowing a private like shard of a chain. So in, in the Polkadot world, a parachain is like a sh- is a shard.、Um, and what that private shard would do is,、um, in like let's say you have you know application A on parachain A, application B on parachain B. You want a, a person, a user of a- application A. To be able to say, you know, I have this education, and I'm proving this to to this other application, so that I can get a loan or whatever. And so, you know, how can this person prove that they have some education? Well, let's posit that then 
chain B is like the university chain and it has all the educational certificates of people. Uh, but you don't want to like give away all that information that the university chain doesn't want to publish all of its state to the world uh, would be dumb in many ways. <laughs> um, so this person A, you know, like on application A can say, please, you know, send a request to chain B and have them prove that I have this education. So they can, chain B can then reply with a zero knowledge proof saying, yes, this person has this education and they don't have to show the, the, the certificate. They don't have to reveal any more information from their system than simply to say, yes, they have this education. And then chain A can go off and do with that information what they want. Um, and so you have as a whole a system that maintains the privacy of people's educations, uh, but it can still be used in the system. Um, so I think that both, you know, privacy points are super exciting to explore and how to actually interoperate with privacy. Uh, but then the scaling stuff is like, I, in some weird way, I think that's what will be explored first. And it's like the easier thing to argue about, and it might have less implications if it breaks. Um, but there's like a, a million scaling <laughs> applications as well. Yeah. My, my prediction, and you know, I'll put this on air so I can be proved wrong in good epistemic fashion. My prediction is that zero knowledge proofs for scaling will be relatively straightforward, and they most they mostly just replace primitives, which can be implemented in other ways more efficiently. They have equivalent or better security guarantees, and they don't require, they don't really interface with economics or game theory all that much. They're just implementing some algorithm and can be slotted in. Whereas zero knowledge proofs for application layer privacy for governance for staking come with many more you know, game theory, theoretic considerations, many more potential economic problems. If, you know, it's, if it is, is treated as economically different to have things private or public. What are the ways in which that will affect how the system as a whole behaves? I think there will be a lot, a lot more challenging research that we should start on now in that second category. And potentially, to your point, potentially more in that second one, it could potentially be more dangerous, say it breaks, and dangerous on like to a person, not absolutely to a system. Yeah. yeah. Let's go into the first. So shall we, in this context of zero knowledge proofs for interoperability, shall we explore what scaling or how maybe the ZKP for scaling can be used in an interoperability context? Uh, sure. So IBC actually reduces to uh, very simple scaling primitives. IBC just requires uh, basically two things. It requires a light client algorithm, a way to verify the consensus transcript of the other chains you care about, and a state verification algorithm like a usually vector commitment, so a Merkle tree proof, for example, of a way to check if a particular packet has been committed in an outgoing queue on one chain or received in an incoming queue on another chain. And those two primitives can both, in different ways, potentially be instantiated with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, I think the most likely candidate is the former because it is the more expensive, um, the, the most expensive right now, light client verification. Uh, currently, there is some ongoing work by Cello uh, with a fork of, of Zexy to implement, uh, uh, I believe it's light client verification for BLS 12.377 of either their blockchain or a future version of their blockchain in a zero knowledge proof, which is really cool because you can compress all of the header checks into just one proof. So you can prove like a whole epic two weeks worth of headers with one succinct zero knowledge proof. And I think to do that, they use recursive specifically, like a form of recursive snarks. You wouldn't have to, but I do believe that we, we had them on the show. We should, we'll link the, the episode in the show notes, but, um, yeah, I think they are, but you wouldn't have to, even if it was, you know, you compress two weeks worth of like lane proofs, headers, whatever it may be, there's few enough to them, few enough of them to check now that it's you know, vastly better. And this, that what you just described there, though, that's sort of the ZK rollup version, right? Where you're batching data. It's similar. Uh, one important distinction and one way in which the terminology needs to be clarified oh, yeah. is that some light clients verify 
consensus transcript only, but other like clients also verify either the entire state transition function or part of the state transition function. So another like client in a zero knowledge proof is what uh, Coda protocol is working on, but that uh, is really a full node client. Uh, it verifies the entire state transition function from Genesis using recursion. Which is also a stateless client. And yeah, <laughs> like it, it's a bunch of things, uh, and it kind of makes everything complicated to talk about. Um, but I mean, the, this is a good example of um, it being new, and we don't really know yet. Like, no one has proven this in a in a production application, uh, but it's 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 very close, and we can imagine, you know, with Coda, it's it's taking away everything, and you just have this one proof and. Here you go, you know, everything here is valid, but then you have a, a secondary problem of like, how do you make this useful? You still need to pass around data that, that people can operate on. Uh, it just doesn't happen on chain anymore. Right. Well, uh, and there are differences in what you can do in the state machine. So in Coda's case, uh, they get the benefit of being able to verify the state transition function on just, you know, on phones with one zero, single zero knowledge proof, but they then have to craft their entire state machine to be efficiently checkable in a circuit. And that comes with a lot of constraints. I want to actually correct what I just said before when I said ZK rollup and batching. I just realized how different that actually is because ZK rollup is batching transactions. And what you're talking about is batching headers. So maybe the word batching is incorrect here somehow, but like to make a like client. Similar, yeah. I mean, but that, I mean, I guess you're still using a ZKP here as a validity proof, right? That's like the context in which it's being used, but completely different data underlying it and very different use case. Yeah, yeah, different data and different use case, but it's being used as a validity proof. You touched on another thing that I I want to talk about as well, because I think it is important, it, particularly in an interoperability context is... Um, those vector commitments that you were talking about, Merkle proofs in almost all cases, where um, a lot of interoperability works by saying, here's a block, like if you have the like client, the like client can help you decide which chain you're on, right? But it doesn't usually help you decide this block is correct or this, this state transition is executed correctly. And so... Um, you once you start getting into that you have to like provide the whole block and the merkle tree or the like subtree of all the transactions in that block like if you wanted to verify that an ethereum block is correct you'd need a massive merkle proof to do so and um compressing that merkle proof is actually I, I think that is a super important thing to get to. It's a bit more complicated. It's a bit more like blockchain dependent, like which exact blockchain, what exactly are you trying to do or trying to prove? So it's not as generic. But I think um, I agree with you that like lines are probably the first and like the lowest hanging fruit in grabbing this. But um, to some degrees, the more important one is like being able to, provide a succinct proof of, you know, here's this data and you can trust that it's correct. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I believe that ETH2 intends to do that. Uh, one constraint it imposes is that you have to pick circuit-friendly hash functions, but changing the hash function in your non-zero knowledge circuit code is generally pretty easy. So it's easy to adopt that. And then you can do a Merkle tree proof relatively efficiently in Knowledge. And this is what uh, Filecoin came to the conclusion of, right? They they had these uh, slow encoding structures and producing massive, massive Merkle proofs to prove that I'm actually storing this file. And it, it proved just impractical, like they couldn't actually build an application that, that used that and they had to go to a ZKP to compress that. Um, but let's I... say you now wanted to prove to a different chain that you're, I'm storing this file, then I don't not only need to provide the proof of that storage, but also the proof that someone is paying for this storage. And like that gets into the state of the chain as well as like the file. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's, there's ample space here to explore <laughs> in the future. And uh, for a lot of these things, I think we have to 
we have to find some way of compressing and maybe ZKPs aren't the only way to compress that, but uh, I think it's certainly necessary to find better things than Merkle proofs for a lot of these cases. Just before though, you described, you just described a ZK Merkle proof. Is that different from a, like, I can imagine it's different, but I don't actually understand what you mean by that, by a ZK Merkle proof. Are you thinking like a recursive proof that looks like a Merkle tree or? Uh, no, uh, well, that's, you could also, you can do <laughs> recursive proofs in a tree. I don't know if Coda does it. I would be surprised if they don't do it, but um, uh, that's however different than a Merkle proof in a zero knowledge circuit, which is just creating a circuit that uh, uh, encodes that a Merkle proof with some input um, uh, and like the input is secret because you don't want it to be oh. stored. Some input uh, verified correctly. And then you check the Merkle proof in the circuit and prove that the proof checked and the verifier just checks the constant, constant size proof. I'm still not, for, for whatever reason, I'm still not clear where the ZKP is. Like, is it, because I'm just picturing a Merkle tree with like these hashes going all the way up and I'm like, right, right. are they replacing the hashes? There's one ZKP and it's around the whole thing. Okay. So the ZKP uh, encodes that the entire thing uh, is correct. The and then entire thing is correct okay. and the prover, when they uh, prove, has to basically do a bunch of hashes in the zero knowledge prover uh, transformation. Okay. So I had a... I, like this is kind of I don't know if this is exactly scaling, but it's compressing and I don't know if this makes any sense. But as I was thinking about it and as I was exploring more like ZK rollup stuff, going back to that, this idea when you talk about interoperability, is there a way I'm probably totally off base here, but is there a way that you would and maybe that's actually what we're talking about with the light clients, but would you be able to take um Instead of it being off-chain transactions, it'd be A-chain transactions and then use ZK rollup somewhere else? Uh, quite possibly. Uh, it depends what you want. You could use one chain for data availability and another chain or chains for actual execution. That's quite possible. Currently, I, I think ZK rollup with on-chain data availability, which is one of the most... Um, well-implemented solutions that I know about uses one chain for both of those things. So they use the Ethereum chain both for yeah. data availability and transaction transaction uh, input data, and they use it for verification using the like um, precompiles for snark verification on Ethereum. But you can separate those out hmm. uh, if you have some way to communicate between those two chains. I think that will actually make a lot of sense because optimizing your chain for Data availability and optimizing your chain for verifying proofs are very different things. And if you have one chain that does both, it has to compromise a bit. Mm. Especially in this sort of multi-chain universe where there's like chains with very different properties, this might be really interesting because some of them might be optimized, like one might be optimized for the data and the other for verification. Now, the caveat is that the more chains you add into the mix and the more uh, you split these different components of the state machine because you care about the gestalt state machine, right? The user is using ZK rollup. They want to send coins. They want those coins to be sent only to one place. Uh, the more the components of the gestalt state machine are split across all of these different chains, the more complex your game theory gets. Uh. Uh, and that will need to be... I would really like to see more formal tools and models developed for reasoning about the game theory of blockchain. There's a lot of hand-waving and Cosmos is as guilty of this as anyone. Uh, you know, we continuously try to improve the state of our analysis. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm not a game theory uh, expert. I, 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 um, I've never studied it. And so I don't know what the academic state of, of game theory research looks like or what models they use or have. Uh, Alistair, who works at the as a researcher at Web3 Foundation, he used to actually work in game theory. He used to be you know, in academia in game theory, um, and I like I, I completely agree. Like we need to bring whatever exists. If if nothing exists, then you know game theory as a whole needs to improve. <laughs> but <laughs> we certainly need to bring more into the blockchain world, where we're kind of saying you know. Well, as long as someone gets punished when they misbehave, then it's fine. But like, really, you know, we probably should work out how much they need to be punished in some exact form or like in some formal method. Uh, or 
Yeah, there's also a lot of like, kind of yeah, they need to be punished. But then some people are saying, well, they they don't need to be punished. Like the social pressure is enough. Right, right, right. And it's like, well, <laughs> I worry about relying on social pressure because I think the social pressure will go away. We have this now. It's a tight knit community. People care about their reputations. Uh, people are nice. They're altruistic. Uh, but we can't expect to rely upon that. In the yeah. future, better to stress test now. So I think validators should be a little more brutal. But then going, but what you're talking about with that economic challenging or these e economics uh, simulations around zero knowledge proofs, what does that even look like? Because you're not, it's like, say you did that split that we described and then you want to balance economics. Is it sort of like where what the validators on each of these chains get or is it something totally different? Uh, what? Yeah, what's at stake? Uh, what could potentially be stolen or double spent by violating the protocol? Luckily, zero knowledge proofs have a you know, well-specified definition. So you should be able to construct these proofs without, you know, reasoning about the specifics of like the polynomial equipment scheme your zero knowledge proof uses or anything like that. You can just say that it's computationally sound and we, that is good enough for most of what you're actually going to do. But you need to reason about what the chains are, what the application state is, what, you know, value it potentially has in the case of tokens or financial instruments and how that can impact the incentives for um, actors. On yeah. the protocol. I mean, I think as concrete example, Ethereum lowered the prices of call data, which means that it's easier to put data on chain for availability, but that doesn't bloat the state. And so that's like a step forward for Ethereum. But imagine if they didn't do that, people would need to find some other place to put their data. Let's say they put that on our weave. We did an episode with our weave and we tried to get to the bottom of what's the probability that someone will lose your data on our weave. And we can't really answer it. It's like low, <laughs> probably. <laughs> it's, it's like a probabilistic answer, first mm. of all. But but then it's also there's no like formal definition or formal analysis on what that actually looks like. So let's say there's an application that puts all of its data for availability on our weave, and then puts the state on Ethereum. You know, now what's the probability that someone can double spend on Ethereum? Um, or that they, the data is lost or that, you know, what's the cost of putting the data there? Or like if you're you're now also dealing with a, a distributed distributed system. <laughs> so you you have this uh, train and hotel problem that Ethereum 2 talks about a lot. Like if I, I only want to book a hotel if I also book the train. So I need to be guaranteed that my data is on our weave before I put this data on Ethereum. And so how do I guarantee that? Oh. Like there's so many like questions that need to be analyzed once you start splitting this up um, huh. that, um, yeah, we, we don't really have tools to do that analysis even. So then let's go on to that second example or that second category that you mentioned at the beginning of this kind of topic. That is the zero knowledge proofs sort of more in the privacy context where they would live on, or actually maybe it's a few, I think you had this topic and then a subset. Yeah, how, the how did you define it again? The second maybe category <laughs> is really zero knowledge proofs for anything other than scaling, okay. where they are involved in application state, which you care about. And uh, usually you care about, I, maybe they're, I can only think for now of caring about it because you want to make some of it private. Okay. Um, now, what you want to make private can vary. In the case of a currency, you might want to make uh, the sender recipient an amount of every transaction private as is done in Zcash. Uh, but say you want a governance system where people can privately vote, then you would want to make uh, the voter private um, and like some details about how they voted so you can identify them based on metadata. We could conceivably, although there's an open question as to whether it's a good idea, we could conceivably have parts of proof of stake be private where who delegated to whom, the amount in which they delegated uh, well, you can't make all of it private, but you can make parts of it private. Gotcha. So some of it is sort of like keeping things private on a single chain and then trying to maybe be like interoperate because you could do, I mean, you could be private on one chain if you wanted right. so to, the, which is fine. The simplest model of uh, privacy interacting with interoperability is where the state of the uh, zero knowledge system and the uh, uh, like what the data is. So notes in the case of a Zcash record that's uh, providing the uh, privacy semantics is all on one chain. 
So the Zcash chain, say, could, uh, and we hope will in the future, connect over IBC to other chains. Then users could transfer the tokens to Zcash. They could shield them on Zcash, send them around as shielded, uh, this is assuming Zcash implements uh, custom assets, but they could send them around as, you know, in the shielded pool. They would, all these different denominations while on that chain in that one circuit would share an anonymity, an, anonymity set uh, so no one looking at uh, the transactions could tell whether they were Zcash or Cosmos tokens or Polkadot tokens, whatever. Mm. Now, that's uh, the simple model because it doesn't rely on any sort of cross-chain state, but that means that when you send these tokens to Zcash and send them around on Zcash, as long as you're doing that, they're private. But as soon as you send them back out again to some other chain to do something else, uh, they are rendered transparent again in order to have uh, privacy across the chain where you don't reveal um, even when you're executing cross-chain transactions uh, exactly what you're doing. Uh, you would need zero-knowledge proofs that function with state on multiple chains. Got it. Now, there are versions of that that look just like sharding where you want you know, one really big Zcash uh, that needs multiple chains to handle all the transaction throughput, and you can split up your uh, note set, for example, a nullifier set onto different um, shards that can execute transactions in parallel and synchronize every block or something. But there are more complex versions of that where you want... Uh, different state to be private on different chains where you want a private currency on Zcash, but then you want to send some tokens while uh, retaining privacy. You don't want to make them transparent. You want to send them over to Cosmos and then use them to privately vote. Mm -hmm. And that will require, uh, that might potentially require like three zero knowledge proof systems. The one on Zcash uh, for uh, sending currency, the one on Cosmos for privately voting, and some like special bridge proof in between to transition from a note on Zcash to a like, delegator entry that can vote in the Cosmos system while retaining privacy. Wow. And in order to implement that bridge, uh, you have to make some more assumptions. I mean, then the two uh, proof systems have to be willing to accept parts of each other's state. So they would be exposed to uh, you know counterfeiting uh, wow. bugs as Zcash had once. Uh, so that's you have got to want to be careful. I mean, that would be basically like going from like you'd have tokens and transparent, you'd move them into shielded, you'd send them somewhere that remained private. They were used in a shielded context, and I don't know if you'd then send them back or something. But like, I mean, that could also be create. That would be like crazy on the mixing front too. Just picture that you like go into this shielded state, you move it to some other chain, and then come out of that shielded state over there. I feel like regulators wouldn't like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it should be possible to implement all of the uh, uh, separated keys that Zcash has implemented, and especially the sapling circuit, the viewing key, spending key, that allow for certain sorts of regulatory compliance in a cross-chain context. It doesn't really change yeah. that problem. That seems really... Do you, do you think that that's what it's going to look like, that it would be these three ZKPs? There's three constructions, or do you picture it like being a more unified? It really depends on the economics, and I'm not sure how the economics will turn out. There are a lot of complexities, and there are a lot of what you might call coordination problems. So, in the case of shielded um, tokens, we want, you know, we as users of a system who want privacy want the anonymity set to be as large as possible. When we send transactions, we want it to be, uh, you know, we us to be one of n where n is as high as, as possible. possible. And in order to do that, everyone needs to be using the same anonymity set. If you have different Zcash circuits on different chains with different anonymity sets. They could uh, be traceable. They just could just be too yeah, small. Yeah, you can identify when people switch between them or they're too small. Um, so you want there to be one anonymity set. But then that's in tension with uh, several other considerations. It's in tension with scaling. Then everything has to happen. Maybe you can chart parts of it, uh, but everything has to happen within some consensus agreement. It's in tension uh, with uh, potentially security because then if all of your value is on this one chain, how on earth do you have enough proof of work or proof of stake securing it? Um, and it's also in tension... Uh, uh, potentially in tension with programmability or configurability. Uh, so let's say you want uh, different assets to have different rules. You want one particular asset, uh, transactions in that asset need to pay a percentage-based fee. 
Now, implementing a percentage-based fee while retaining privacy uh, <laughs> is tricky because if someone gets a percentage of every transaction, even if it's private, so even if like I have a particular you know key and I'm the special person and I get the five percent tax, then I know what the amount of every transaction yeah. is because I know that there's a rule which has that five percent has to go to me. Um, so you know maybe there are fancy workarounds where you like shard a variable that viewing key. too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there are also cases, there are cases when you might want that sort of uh, supply audit auditability in between different yeah. chains where you want I, you know, uh, uh, guard against the risk of counterfeiting or something like that. I spoke with so Alistair from Web3, the person that you just mentioned, Frederick. I actually spoke with him before this episode, and I was thinking it might actually be interesting to have him come on and explain some of the stuff that he relate to me, but I'll try to relate it to you, which is about, so with this XCMP spree, uh, are those, do you say that together? No, they're okay. two di different two things. Th so, but they both help in, well, XCMP is sort of IBC with assumptions around Polkadot security model. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Spree is shared something else. Computation kind of thing. Yeah. So in in hit the way he just he just sort of described something kind of similar to what you had just said, this sort of like overarching Zcash and using Spree to do a lot of the cross chain message passing. Like you wouldn't have then like three ZKP systems. You'd have this spree that sort of acts between them as an overarching space where a ZKP could exist. Yeah. So, I mean, Spree, to explain it shortly, is a shared piece of code between a bunch of different chains, and they all call that specific code. So they they trust that that code is correct and is executed correctly. So in the Polkadot world, this would be a piece of code that lives on the relay chain, and the relay chain executes it. And so it's not each individual chain that is responsible for executing that code. This is a problem that you get into when both with sharding and with um, building for interoperability and there, are, there exist many different chains. The question is how can you compose these chains? I can't trust that your chain is actually going to be the same thing that it is today, tomorrow. Ethereum changes all the time and the only way to have a guarantee that what I'm calling on your chain is still the same is if your chain never changes. But in Polkadot, we solve this with Spree by saying there is this shared piece of code that you can always trust is the same because that's the sort of guarantee that it's intended to provide. So you can compose and interoperate in a better way, in a more trusted way um, through Spree. And in the context of ZKPs and what we talked about with like a shared nullifier set, trying to make that as large as possible, you'd still run into the, the case of like, if it becomes too large, then it's still too large for a spree. Uh, but you could have the ZKP stuff live in spree, or you could have the nullifier set live in spree, and then the chains sort of just interact based on that. It's a bit like an enclave idea, yeah, and yeah. there would exist the same on every chain. Do you feel like, is there is there more on the privacy, this sort of tr shared privacy model that you'd want to mention? Um, one other challenge, even if we solve the scaling challenges uh, uh, in terms of maximizing the anonymity set, is dealing with the potential economics of proof of stake. So uh, proof of stake tokens are inflationary. Uh, and that means that if you just send them to Zcash, uh, you are being taxed effectively for holding your tokens in the anonymity set. Uh, this is quite a concern because for uh, the purpose of providing anonymity, we want everyone to hold their tokens in the anonymity set. But uh, if you're taxed when doing that, that's not going to be so popular. You mean like if you were sending it from a sep a different proof of stake chain to Zcash? Right, right. Okay. So if you send if you send your Cosmos atoms to Zcash. Yeah. Uh, you will be able to then transact privately, but you will no longer receive staking rewards. It's basically like an opportunity cost. You've you've taken out your tokens from your own validator or delegation to somebody else, and you've like right. used it to be private. Right now, in yeah. the model of say co uh, of IBC token transfers, it would be fairly easy to add another little application layer protocol, which would allow the shielded pool on another chain to be delegated. So you could state that uh, the Zcash chain like 
has X atoms because you, and you know because they're transparent when they leave the cosmos hub, you you know what X is and X atoms you know are delegated to some validator, but figuring out which that validator is, maybe it should be the ZK validator, figuring out which yeah. that validator is um, uh, and figuring out how to distribute the rewards to the people who have shielded tokens because, of course, you don't know what their balances are, are both unsolved problems. Whoa. This is some next level stuff right here. So a lot of this, a lot of the sort of breakdown of this kind of conversation stems from a workshop that we did this summer, this last summer at the Web3 Summit. Chris, you and I and, and Alistair and a bunch of other people were there talking about CKPs in an interoperability context. And one of the things that was on the board, but I feel like still is very undeveloped, is this idea of what does it mean for a DEX to use zero knowledge proofs in an interoperability context? Could that could that be like a thing? Could it be like that you use roll-up things, roll-up type constructions to improve a DEX in an interoperability context? Would you allow for maybe private transfers through a DEX from one chain to another? This is sort of some of the ideas. Very underdeveloped, though, I would say. Like from our conversation, I don't know if there's been any like work on that since then or if you have any more thoughts. I think that both categories for scaling and for privacy of uh, application are potentially interesting for DEXs. Um, potentially even both at once. Uh, I could certainly imagine cases where you would want some sort of private cross-chain atomic swap where I want to trade my Zcash for your uh, dots and we want to do it in private so Frederick doesn't know and we arrange something <laughs> in zero knowledge uh, that, you know, impacts the state of, say, the Zcash circuit and some zero knowledge circuit on Polkadot, and we also have to use a proof to conduct the transfer. That seems possible. I don't know of any instantiations of anything like this yet. I mean, I feel like uh, just the general topic of DEXs is, is complicated, obviously, but if we're looking at privacy or from a privacy perspective, then exchanges are these sort of accepted middlemen in a world without middlemen and even a, even a dex kind of leaks all information currently and um it's it's a tough one to crack because yeah introducing zkps in everything like having a private order book in the world of finance is a known thing and and it it's not necessarily a popular thing <laughs> yeah yeah i think <laughs> ian like, myers had this great uh, uh, saying, he said that Bitcoin was like Twitter for your bank account. And I think you could extend that to, uh, you know, Ether Delta. I'm, I'm out of date on the Ethereum DEX scene, but um, DEXs are, transparent DEXs are currently like Twitter for your financial brokerage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Cool. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a complex topic. There's definitely something that needs to be done or like needs to look into that, but DEXs have so many other problems to solve before they get to that point that... Yeah, I think it, it's a lo long roadmap for them. Do you see any other kind of ways? Like, do you have any other thoughts on how like zero knowledge proofs could be used and like to do things outside of what they're currently used for? Hmm. Well, oh, here's another. Here's another interesting application. It will probably take a long time to be realized. Maybe it will never be realized. Depends on how bad the concrete constant constants end up being. But I suspect zero knowledge proofs might play an interesting role in networking between nodes and allowing nodes to prove things about state that they're going to send uh, before they send it, which can make uh, certain kinds of like DOS. Uh, much harder because you can require that when you connect to a node over a peer-to-peer -peer network, the node sends you a short and sweet uh, proof attesting to the validity of some data, and then they can start sending the data. And you don't have to. Uh, a lot of a lot of like DOS attacks on peer-to-peer -peer networks are based on exploiting expensive computation. So you can craft data to get the node that you're sending it to to spend a lot of time computing on it, validating it, and this is very problematic and hard to defend against. But if you can prove that the data you're sending is valid and that you've already validated it, and they can just check the zero knowledge proof, um, which has some like known time complexity, uh, that would be pretty useful. I I really appreciate that we've had a chance to sort of get into this topic on the podcast. We had done this workshop, and I'm really happy that we've now maybe exposed some of these ideas to more people. Um, 
But before, so I want to say thank you for joining. Well, thank you for having me. But before we sign off, is there anything else, maybe like related to zero knowledge proofs or like in the same sort of sphere that you are also excited about or paying attention to? I'll caveat that I know less about all of these, but I think multi-party computation could be interesting for, at the moment it's very interesting for uh, generating uh, uh, toxic waste for zero knowledge proof system setups, but also interesting for other use cases, potentially like keeping data private without writing a circuit. Um, you know, you don't want the data, if you don't want the data to live on the client, but you still want some sort of privacy, um, then you need something like MPC. Zero knowledge proofs for privacy only work if you keep the data, you know, client side. Uh, I think there's been some recent theoretical progress that I wouldn't claim to understand in the area of code obfuscation, which is very applicable to blockchains uh, because people might want to publish secret, secret algorithms or publish code to smart contracts that they want other people to be able to execute but not to be able to read or analyze and code obfuscation. I think that wow. asymptotic uh, costs of doing it are still very, very high. But yeah. We talked with Dan Bonet in, the, in, in his episode about this and like cryptographic code obfuscation, meaning there can be a smart contract that holds a private key to something. Right, exactly. Is, is uh, an amazing, you know, think piece. Just like the, uh, if you think about the ability of having that, it, it's pretty amazing. You can do some very cool stuff. But this wouldn't be like, this This is not related then to what we talked with Zach and Ariel about, this idea of like function privacy. No. This uh, is... That's just like execution of that is private uh, but in this case you can publish everything but it's still private okay well um, right people can execute the code uh you publish it like it, it's like what windows tries to do when they send people binaries without send them sending them source code but they're failing because you can take apart the binary and figure out you know the many bugs uh windows actually ship to production uh what they what we might want to do in uh uh, the future of blockchains is do proper code obfuscations so that people can ship smart contracts that anyone can run, but no one can decode. Nice. Well, listen, thanks so much for joining and having Thank this having wide ranging conversation. It's been really fun. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. <laughs>